We celebrate our lives, we celebrate together, we celebrate our lives, we live with gratitude. There is wonder all around us, earth and sky and sea. We are blessed to be a light to share the mystery. We celebrate our lives each day. As we light the chalice, please join together in our chalice lighting blessing. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. Good morning. My name's Deborah Bryant. James Bryant and I would like to welcome you to Cascade UU's online Sunday service. Whether you're in your Sunday finest or just your jammies, whoever you are, you're welcome here. Our opening words are from the Baha'i faith, Abdu'l-Baha. No man should blindly follow his ancestors and forefathers. Nay, each must see with his own eyes, hear with his own ears, and investigate the truth himself, in order that he may follow the truth instead of blind acquiescence and imitation of ancestral beliefs. Now please join together in voice and spirit to sing our opening song, Turning of the World. Every 
Good morning. We're talking today about conversations and how to use our UU principles to strengthen and, and enrich, deepen, and, and make our conversations with others, particularly those maybe that we don't have a lot in common with, healthier and better conversations. I'd like to talk today about a conversation that I've been having, a, a peculiar and really very difficult conversation I've been having over the past three years with the poet Naira Wahid. Uh, she's a, a black woman, and I've shared some of her poetry with you, and so I've shared some of this conversation. Um, and it's challenging. Uh, it's very challenging. She's talking to me, um, but she's made it very clear that she doesn't want to hear back from me. She uses language that makes it explicit that she is telling me things. You this, you that. And she makes it very clear that She's not interested in what I have to say back to her. I, I think, um, I, and I have to infer that, like she wants me to do something with this information. She wants me to read it. And I think based on, you know, the implications in her poetry and also what I hear from her friends and colleagues, what she wants me to do is share this conversation with you, to have it with you, to have it with other folks like me. And, and it's painful. She's mad, rightly so. She's very angry at me and at others like me. And she also makes it clear that, um, that she's disdainful and has a lot of disgust. So how do, I, how do I participate in this conversation without falling into a shame pit and crawling into a hole and ignoring the whole thing or, or getting mad or, or begging her for help? That, that doesn't work. One of the things about this conversation that, that struck me very profoundly, because I love language, is the way she talks about the difference between how she uses language, including English, and the way I use it. Now, I witness this phenomenon a lot in my work. I'm sitting with a couple and I realize they're using the same words, but they don't mean the same thing at all. They're using the same language, but that, boy, their communication is, is not working. She makes this explicit in a very different way, a way that I think is specific to the fact that she's black. So I have two poems here that she wrote that I'm gonna share with you about language. Uh, the first is entitled, I have seven different words for love you have only one. That makes a lot of sense. 
My English is broken on purpose. You have to try harder to understand me. Breaking this language you so love is my pleasure. In your arrogance, you presume that I want your skinny language, that my mouth is building a room for it in the back of my throat. It is not. And the second poem is entitled E-N-G-L-I-S-H for all of us who are held captive. I stumble in this language. I fall down in this language. I am pain in this language. My mouth, heart, arms are losing muscle in this language. My body does not recognize the taste of this language. I long in this language. I am not myself in this language. Thank you. Like our opening words, the next two pieces of wisdom also come from the Baha'i faith, and again from Abdul Baha. And the breeding ground of all these tragedies is prejudice, prejudice of race and nation, of religion, of political opinion, and the root cause of prejudice is blind imitation of the past, imitation in religion, in racial attitudes, in national bias, in politics.
So long as this aping of the past persisteth, just so long will the foundations of the social order be blown to the four winds. Just so long will humanity be continually exposed to direst peril. But there is need of a superior power to overcome human prejudices, a power which nothing in the world of mankind can withstand and which will overshadow the effect of all other forces at work in human conditions. That irresistible power is the love of God. It is my hope and prayer that it may destroy the prejudice of this one point of distinction between you and unite you all permanently under its hallowed protection. From the Shaker Hymn, entitled, Tis a Gift. When true simplicity begins, to bow and to bend, we shall not be afraid. To turn and turn shall be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. You're such a perfect little alien, Sally's mother said as she opened the door. I'd been invited to my first birthday party at the home of Sally, the little redhead girl who lived at the end of the block. She was also turning three. It was a costume party, and my mother had dressed me up as a shiny blue alien being with antenna and all. I was delighted with my outfit. After cake and ice cream, Sally unwrapped her gifts. I can remember the unveiling of the largest box which contained a brand new toy called Play-Doh Factory. Oh my gosh, did we have fun. The smell, the feel, and the taste of Play-Doh will be forever in my memory. As the excitement died down, all the other children and mothers slowly left the party. My mother and hers came out to the play area both Sally and I were becoming distressed to the point of tears. We were facing each other, each claiming to be correct in knowing and showing which was our right hand. Sally was facing me. As she would raise her right hand, that hand across from my left shoulder would move, not the side my right hand was on. I know it was my right hand because my mother had told me so. You can see where this is going. Our mothers, seemingly unified in their thoughts, simply spun us both around so we'd be facing the same direction. My mom told us to settle down and listen. I want you and Sally each to raise your right hand, she said. We did. Now, we both raise the same right hand, and correctly so. Sally's mom exclaimed, well, looky there, you're both right. Sally and I turned to each other with wide eyes at this display of grown-up magic. Thankfully, the adults had come into the room to offer a new perspective. Turning, turning. I am now 63 years old. Just over four years ago, I was once again turned around, fighting a good battle, but spinning out due to the stress of my own misdirection. I came back to Cuff for guidance, feeling like I didn't know my right from my left anymore. Reverend Laura and my dear friend Verna and the rest of my family here at Cuff helped me to get recalibrated and reoriented but only because I became willing to have that difficult conversation with someone about Jim. We found ourselves moving to Kashmir to what I like to call an historic bungalow just a couple of blocks from the Wenatchee River. Our new landlord pointed out who our new neighbors were. One in particular, I'll call him Bob, was the extra curious sort. He liked to keep an eye on things in the neighborhood. As I eyeball his residence across the street, I see flagpole, check, red truck, 
check. Inappropriate bumper stickers, check. Hmm, I say to myself, don't stereotype Jim. I'm sure he's okay, even if he doesn't share your political taste. These issues were confirmed the next day at the mailbox. I was in my yard. He had pulled his car up to the mailbox, which is next to ours at the fence. Fritz barked and I stepped up the hill with him to introduce myself. Hey neighbor, you must be Bob. I'm Jim, nice to meet you, I said. He nodded. I pointed to the retriever in the, in the back of the car and said, nice dog. He answered, yeah, that's Zoe, she's getting pretty old. He gazed down the street and pointed at the new construction and commented about the Mexicans buying up the whole block and building houses. I felt the ick, racial bias rearing its ugly head. I remained silent. He stated, well, I'd better get my car out of the road and get on home. I said, okay, next time then, nice to meet you and Zoe. He left. I went back in the yard and got Fritz. Hmm, I needed a cool respite, perhaps a short walk to the river to consider my welcome to the neighborhood experience. Fritz and I took this journey to cool off. I had been collecting river stones to make a bird bath in my yard. The river water level was low enough that you could walk out almost to the middle where there was an exposed sandbar. I immediately spied something red, oddly shaped and out of place. I approached the object, pull it out of the wet sand and rinse it off. I had discovered a brick well worn by what must have been decades in the bottom of the Wenatchee River. I look across the river at the mill wheel and also look for other structures that might, it might have fallen from. It beckoned me to take it home. I did. I had a plan for this brick. It would become, it would perform the role of icebreaker. Bob seemed to be a genuinely cheerful guy. And I felt called somehow to express to him that he, I, and the Mexicans down the street are all part of the interconnected web of life to somehow demonstrate the inherent worth and dignity of all people. He is an old timer, a retired railroad man, and he would know the area history and seemed talkative enough that he might share it with me. This brick would now hopefully become the centerpiece of an ongoing, friendly, and amiable conversations. On my next occasion to see him, he again pulled up by my fence to get his mail. I once again greeted him, hey Bob, you seem to know the area pretty well. I found this brick in the middle of the river and I was wondering what building it might have been attached to. After examining it, he looked at me, said, I don't know, maybe somebody just threw it out there. We, then we both laughed at the juxtaposition of our bu views about the brick's origin. I told him I had a book containing the pictorial history of Wenatchee Valley and asked if he would mind looking at it with me as I could use the nickel tour. And so it was. We looked at books, shared pictures and knowledge, and before long, some wisdom. As our conversations continued, we reviewed local history back in time until there was no more cashmere or even white man yet. This is the place where the conversation about race bias could begin. We had built some trust in one another and had been, a, had been able to converse. Those conversations were personal and will not be shared out of respect for all parties. I will say that by following UU principles, the conversation continues and continues to progress towards the idea of unity of all peoples turning, turning until we get on the same page. We care for each other now.
He plows our snowy driveways in the winter, and we bring him homemade chili, turkey chili, and good cheer. We watch for deliveries at each other's houses, and happily, no more racial commentary occurs. We have become good neighbors. How did this happen? I didn't tell anyone what to do. I just planted some seed and some spiritual fertilizer, and growth happened on its own. There always seems to be one in a crowd, and there is one in the neighborhood who, so far, refuses all peaceful interaction. Enter the house on the corner, a local monument to hate and its dutiful curator who will call Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown has family that lives nearby. Within two weeks of moving in, one of his relatives approached me to warn me about his violent tendencies in history. I was told that he would holler at people and try to bait them into a fight and was advised not to fall for it. Okay, Jim, check your own biases here and remember that there are no bad people, only people who do bad things. Fritz does bark from time to time. Mr. Brown yells the moment he makes a sound, ignoring all other dogs and even the very loud din from the occasional nearby passing train. Immediately, Mr. Brown started his familiar pattern of yelling, shut that dog up. This is always followed by incoherent ranting and continual baleful staring. I know that any response we offer would just be throwing fuel on the fire. As his house faces the construction of Hispanic families' new homes, he decided to put up a new sign to let them know how he feels about their presence. The huge sign read, Build the Wall, creating a spiritual eyesore and certainly a daily, continual racial jab that they must now see every time they look out the window. It doesn't end there. Mr. Brown took on a female renter at one point, an acquaintance of ours. He tortured her with verbal and emotional abuse for months, culminating in the placement of a mannequin head in his window, mimicking her. This mannequin head had a bullet hole in it, and red paint had been placed around the hole, simulating blood. She sought legal help. Charges were filed, and his weapons were taken away for a period of one year. Renter found safe haven elsewhere and is still in contact. There should nothing to stop Mr. Brown from his continuing his daily rants. Last year, he decided to double down on his hate by updating his oversized sign to 
Finish the wall. Well, I thought to myself, Mr. Brown, not with my brick. So how am I ever going to converse with Mr. Brown? Do I need to? Is it my business to turn him round right to suit my own opinion? No, no. That's not having a conversation with someone. So I pull out my most powerful tool, prayer. I believe only an unwell mind can hate. So I must pray for that mind to be healed. Did I mention I'm in recovery? During our first year in Kashmir, I started attending a local 12-step meeting just a couple of blocks from my house. During one meeting, the topic of recreation or recreation came up. Could I or do people in recovery have fun? I mentioned my love of music and how I felt most free while doing it and how much I missed that. I described how it centers me and the inner peace that it brings. That caught the attention of another member who spoke to me afterwards. He said he played a little guitar and drums as well. And he in invited me over the next day to jam a bit. And we did that for most of a year, building the relationship and knowing that we had different beliefs did not stop us from becoming friends. We both started from a place of caring about a common cause, our life and death struggle for recovery. We were both in the same lifeboat, so to speak, and isolation had ruled my existence for far too long. This is the primary function of this 12-step fellowship. We believe we have to give it away to keep it, as we say. So the holiday season came around. And for New Year's, we decided to invite other local musicians and the whole recovery community to stage a live music event. Food, dance, etc. It was a great success and much fun. After that, we picked up another guitar player, and the next year we picked up yet another, and finally a real bassist. We became a band, Rule 62. We can exist together only because we have a common cause and that we have agreed to be in covenant with each other. Both UU and 12-step principles apply. We all play an equal part and we, all, and we have agreed to treat each other with love and kindness, to be supportive, that each other's fe personal feelings matter and that their vote counts. And when a difference arises, we stop, reflect, and re-engage just as we do in cuff. That way, our disagreements never descend into arguments. It, it is not always easy. The idea is to stop fighting with everything and everybody. Things come up. We are not all of the same political or religious backgrounds or beliefs but we respect each other's search for the truth. One incident comes to mind. A football game was on the big screen, muted during band practice. One member stopped playing in the middle of the song and says, no, you got to stand for the flag. You can't kneel for the national anthem. It's un-American. They aren't paid to have an opinion. What's their problem? The music stopped, everybody stopped. Immediately, the discussions opened up about race, inequality, police violence, injustice, etc. That conversation got pretty heavy, but it ended up much lighter than it started. Spiritual progress was made. This was due really to the healthy covenant-like boundaries having been set beforehand. The rewards of having those difficult conversations as they come up, rising above our differences, feel so very powerful. And when we get to play for people, our energy is then good, healing, vital, and the message of unity is strong. 
it has become its own rewards. And it feels as if for a moment we have all come round right. Our name, Rule 62, reflects that we all have the right to be wrong. A Baha'i quote comes to mind from Shoghi Effendi out of Unfolding Destiny, page 456. We must not only be patient with others, infinitely patient, but also with our own poor selves, remembering that even the prophets of God sometimes got tired and cried out in despair. And so, the brick became a cornerstone of many conversations, and its well-worn edges spoke of patience against abrasive things. And I will do well to continue following its example. And now, join us in voice or spirit for our closing song, Power of Kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. We don't know what's coming. We can help shape what's ahead. With kindness as our currency, the commonwealth is in our hands. So give a little, give a little. Give a little, give a little, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go round, there's more than enough. As we extinguish this chalice, please join together in our chalice extinguishing blessing. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Now raise your hands in the spirit of connection as we sing our closing song together. 
Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again.